equity, diversity, and inclusion at North Seattle College. And on behalf of President um, Dr. Shamine Crawford and our Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, DeAndre Fisher, uh, I'm excited to welcome you all this morning and uh, to read our land acknowledgments. On behalf of North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe, a people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here and who may be in the room with us this morning. Uh, the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion is committed to supporting indigenous and native students beyond the land acknowledgements. Our institutional actions include building a strong partnership with the Urban Native Education Alliance and the Clear Sky, Leaders Clear Sky Youth Leadership Council, building a pathway for indigenous and native students from high school to North Seattle College and an endowed scholarship for indigenous and native students. I'm excited to introduce Jeffrey this morning. Um, so Jeffrey Vergi is an award-winning Native American artist and writer from the Port Campbell Saklalem tribe. For thousands of years, native and non-native storytellers have used art as a means to share the tales of their people. For me, I'm carrying on a tradition that started with my ancestors by simply using the means of today and all its modern conveniences to share the tales that I love. Art evolves, tools get better, but the essence of what I do is the same as those who did it on the canvases nature provided for them to tell the stories of gods and heroes long, long ago. Jeffrey is best known for his use of forum line design with pop culture inspiration, which his fans dub Salish Geek. He has over 100 comic book covers working for Marvel, IDW, Valiant, Dynamite, Boom, and Dark Horse Comics. Along with his comic work, gallery shows, and public artworks, Jeffrey had a 15-month solo exhibit in 2018 that featured his favorite Marvel character at the Smithsonian in New York City called Of Gods and Heroes, The Art of Jeffrey Verge. The end result being two 50-foot murals that was purchased for the Smithsonian's permanent collection. Most recently, he has agreed to create a large exit mural for Climate Pledge Arena, the future home of Seattle's NHL team, the Kraken. Without further prattle from me, um, Jeffrey, welcome to North Seattle College. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for getting my name right. You were actually the first person that has ever got my name right that didn't ask. So thank you. <laughs> uh, it's a real pleasure and honor here to be here this morning. Uh, you also got me in a rare moment. I am never up this early unless I absolutely have to be. <laughs> I work a lot of late nights doing what I do. Uh, I, I prefer to work at night, uh, just a lot more peaceful. So, but but thank you. I'm honored to be able to speak here today, and uh, I hope that everybody's able to get something from this. Uh, you, like I said, for somebody who draws comic book superheroes, being able to talk to all of you, uh, it's a real honor. So thank you. Um, I guess we'll start uh, a little bit about my name. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Varigi. I grew up on the little in little Boston as our reservation for the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe. Uh, my whole life, I've been a nerd and a geek. Uh, it, since I can't remember, my baby book, my mom has has written down that at three I was drawing robots and and spacemen, uh, and I I can't remember a time when I wasn't drawing or buying toys or reading comics. Uh, I I was just talking to my daughter last night about growing up as as we speak, and I've gotten older. But everything that's in my life, as far as passions go, has been the same for 47 years. So I've been, <laughs> I've gotten older, but I haven't grown up. The work that I do is, uh, is called Salish Geek. It's a blending of form line design. I originally studied with uh, Simshan master David Boxley after I graduated from the Art Institute of Seattle in 2000. It was uh, how I started with him. My tribe hired me to do a logo for them. 
and they wanted a Formline design logo. Now, most of the Formline you see regionally here is borrowed from. It's never quite Coast Salish. We have our own style. There are artists that do traditional Northwest style. People like Sean Peterson from Puyallup Tribe is very well known for that. Uh, what I do is more of a hybrid and it, it's anchored in the Simshan style, which is an Alaskan based. So the shapes are a little different than others. They're a little wider, a little fatter as they get uh, And each tribe. The form line principles are the same, but everybody puts their own fingerprints on. Same thing with color palettes. Color palettes vary from region to region, depending on what pigments that they had had in that, that, that environment. Studied with David uh, for uh, as an apprentice. It was it was a great opportunity. I got him after I was working on that logo because I knew that my logo wasn't. It looked nice, but I had no idea the shapes that I was using. I looked at books, I read some, but uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. I was putting stuff together, and my biggest fear at that moment was that other artists, especially the elder artists. The, the master artist in my own tribe would look at it and say, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's really full of shit on that. <laughs> and I was scared about that. I, I didn't want anybody to say that I didn't know what I was doing. So that's that's how I approached David. And I was very lucky to work with him. While I worked with him in the mornings, I would go and I would draw uh, all morning long. And then the afternoons, I would do finish work as part of my payment for his apprenticeship. I would... Uh, Work, help him work on his projects he was working on, help him sand his masks, help him de-strip trees for totem poles, things like that. After I did that, I worked at a marketing agency for 11 years. And I started out as a production artist and an intern and worked my way up to studio manager and lead designer. I'll start my presentation here and show you some of the work that I do. Awesome. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Mm. Yeah, so, I, and we could even go to the, to the next one too. That's good. Ah. So, <clears throat> while I was working at, the, at Masterworks, when I was working at the agency, I, uh, after you work for an agency like any kind of agency setting as an artist or designer, you get kind of frustrated and and tired. I found that even though you're do, I was doing great work and 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 doing a lot of uh, good things with my work, I wasn't being fulfilled as an artist, a create as a creative. I was not making work just for myself, and that's why I went to art school to begin with was to create works that. I wanted to make and I wanted to create. So I started experimenting, went back and started just pouring through books and going to galleries and museums and looking at various styles of art and the, and mediums that I really liked. At first, I'm, I'm a big expressionist fan. I love expressionism. I love the color. I love the movement. I love the, the feelings that it evokes that, that the, the masters were able to do. And so a lot of my first works that I was creating out of that were were very expressionist expressionistic pieces. You can see a little bit of Chagall in there, a lot of my work, and, and put a little bit of Picasso, Matisse, and you can still see some of those influences today in my work. Uh, as as, but I, and 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 when I was doing that work, I was getting I was getting commissions. I was I was getting in galleries. I was getting in museums with it, but I really wasn't being fulfilled uh, a lot of the times when I was creating the works uh, I would I would ask myself if people were going to buy this and I kept thinking about the consumer and, and and not why I was making it and it wasn't it wasn't fulfilling me like I had hoped not it did for a little while but it didn't so I took a time off I took about a year off from doing any kind of artwork at home and really trying to self-examine who I was and what I was doing. Now, I've been, like I said, I've been a nerd my whole life. Uh, I hadn't accepted that for a long time. Uh, I knew who I was. I, I knew that I was 
the same kid that used to wear some Vulcaneers to middle school. Um, but I didn't want to accept certain aspects of that. Uh, when you get bullied for things like that, uh, it really makes you self doubt. And part of it was, I was, to be honest, I was really concerned my wife was going to wake up one day and say, oh my God, I'm, I'm married to a nerd. <laughs> I'm sleeping in, staring in a bed with a nerd. And I thought she was going to leave me. And uh, it wasn't until I started accepting who I was and loving who I was that I was able to really have a breakthrough with my art. And it was from there that I told her, you know, I haven't made any work that I, I loved. I said, when I was in art school, my, my portfolio was all comic books. It was Star Wars. It was Star Trek. It was everything that I'm doing today, but in the more traditional style that they're known for. And so I thought, you know, I had some ideas with Formline and I thought, well, maybe, I, maybe I can try something. And so I thought I wanted to start making work that I loved with the, with the, with the things that I love, but in my voice. And what was that voice? Well, you know, I, I'm Native American. I know, I know who I'm and where I'm from. And it was important to me that when I, when I did that, that people could see that, that they could see the Native influences on, on the work and see that it was where that work originated and came from. I answered a email from a gallery in Seattle that was doing a Star Wars show that they used to do an annual Star Wars show. They used to work with Lucasfilm and I told them my idea and they said that they would share it with Lucasfilm and that's all I needed. And I started working on stuff right away. Now the first piece that I did, Lucasfilm passed on it. However, they gave me some really good feedback. And from that feedback, I started doing the next pieces. Uh, the piece that everybody knows that, uh, that really put me on the map was the Batman. And that was the next piece that I did. And uh, I, to me, it was uh, a chance to show uh, what Formline could be in, in, modern, in a modern era. It was a chance to show the spirit of what my ancestors were doing, sharing their stories of myths and heroes. Because I mean, most time, if you look at the stories that we share in, in, in Salish culture and in most cultures, we share the, the exploits of our heroes. We share the exploits of our gods. We share the we share the hero's journey, wherever that is. Now, for most of us in this era, we know comic books. I mean, look at the the, the Marvel films, the cinematic Marvel universe. How much that's impacted so many lives. Uh, look at the, the the Warner Brothers with DC films. I mean, you can't you can't go to Netflix without finding superhero movies on almost every category. To the, the, they're they're everywhere, and but that's that's what I know, and, and and that's why I wanted to share. Those are the stories that we know, we understand. So when people see my work, that resonates with them because it's not just native stories that I'm sharing; it's their stories, it's our stories, and I'm just only I'm just doing it in the voice that I was given. Now, some of the, the books that you're seeing right here are some of the covers that I've done. Some of them are prints. Uh, I've worked on everything from Black Panther, Captain America, to Transformers, G.I. Joe, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. I uh, haven't worked with DC. Uh, they, they, I, I, they're pretty much the only company I haven't worked with at this point in my career. Let me go to the next slide. Here we see the, uh, the Batman, which I was best known for uh, for many years. It was uh, my son, his favorite favorite character was Batman. My, my youngest son's favorite character is Spider-Man. They're both favorites of mine, but I wanted to create something for them. So they, I figured even if I don't sell any of these, even if they aren't successful, they'll have a piece of art in their rooms that they can keep forever from their dad. Uh, Batman, I wanted to be able to capture, when I created this, I wanted to capture, create something that really encapsulated the hero, you know, Batman leaping down from a rooftop uh, in swinging in action. Uh, and then, but I also wanted to make sure when I started doing this that I honored the spirit of the shapes. Now, form line, there's some basic shapes that, and elements that are commonly used in, in the works. So we'll start with the Batman there. If you look in his shoulder there, up there by his head, you see that little brick that, that, that's called an ovoid. 
That's my style ovoid. Now there's different various variations of it. Mine's a stylized version, but that's an ovoid that's commonly used for eyes, shoulders, heads, etc. Here I use it in the shoulder. Then we also have salmon eyes, salmon trout eyes, which also are used as joints. And I use that there as his hip. Now the capes, I was trying to figure out how do you want to do capes? Now, capes are flight. It's is indication of flight. And the same thing with rays, laser beams, things like that. So I looked at bird designs and bird designs we use split use in, in them as feathers. And to me, that was a, an extension of capes was that they both signify the same thing, uh, just different eras of where they're being used. The cover on the left is for Jessica Jones, number one. It was for the Black Panther anniversary, and they wanted me to create a 90s version of that. I constantly explore textures. I constantly explore uh, colors, color palettes, and play, uh, stylize. I, I, like to, I, 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 like to keep, I like to keep it fresh. I try to do something new every time I do something because uh, I, I, I myself don't have the attention span to keep doing the same thing over and over again. I get really bored. So I want to see how far I can take these these uh, shapes, how far I can push them. Can you go to the next slide, please? Now, these here uh, might be familiar to some of you. Uh, this is more of traditional as I, this is about as traditional as I can get. Uh, I uh, and this is mainly when I say traditional, I say that in the presentation of the, the shapes and presentation of the piece. It's it's flat. It's a side profile. Um, if you look at native art, you see that we really sh share a lot of vicious animals, but they're beautiful designs. Uh, bears, wolves, sharks, killer whales, uh, all dangerous and all it could kill you without could kill you standing where you stand. To me, uh, I wanted to do take the same thing with Geiger's uh, xenomorph design. I think it's an elegant, beautiful design. It's scary as hell, but it is still also a beautiful, beautiful design. Here, I wanted to create that that sense of what a native version of that might look like. And on the opposite side, you have the face hugger, which is the Another form of that is of that alien. I kept these um, palettes very minimal, uh, so you can see each shape and see uh, and appreciate each shape. I tend to break the rule. One of the ways I break the rules is I don't join all my shapes. Now, if you look at most native art, you see that their shapes are joined together. I like the idea that your eye is allowed to appreciate what's what's going into each design that there are certain elements that I want to, to really look at and be able to appreciate. So I break them away from the, from the main shape, but keep them close enough to know that you're seeing, your, your mind will be able to put together that this is still one creature and not many. Okay, you can go to the next. I also like to play with composition a lot. Composition is, a lot, and a favorite composition of mine is a rectangle. And some people, you know, the psychology of it and the science of it is that our eyes are rectangular in, in rectangular in, or uh, where they're oriented and placed. So our eyes tend to like rectangles better. It's able to see them easier and able to take in and appreciate the shape. So I use a lot of those. This was one of my first ones that I did, and this was for a show this was for my first big show that was at the Museum of Modern Museum Art in Tucson. And it was a, a Cowboys and Pop Culture show. And I was really excited about this because they invited me to create some new pieces for it. And they were going to have uh, some Andy Warhol's work in this show and Roy Lichtenstein. And be able to have my work alongside those guys was awesome. This piece here is Sergio. And it is... In, and I made it inspired by one of my favorite directors, Sergio Leone, who created the Good, the Bad, the Ugly movies, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. If you've ever watched his films, I love the way he exaggerated poses of his of his characters and the way he places them in the camera. It's all very strategic and very well thought, and it creates these juxtapositions that really create this... It, 
create something interesting and you don't want to avert your eyes. You really want to take it all in. And here I wanted to, to try to capture that, that mood, that feeling. I wanted to capture the desolate loneliness of the desert with the, but also make sure you have the warm hues, but also have, you can see villains are villains and heroes are heroes here. And here you can see that the form line designs that I was using in this, they were more ultra stylized. I had them in his poncho and some in their bodies, but it wasn't, again, far from traditional native art that you would see from this region. And feel, please feel free, if you have any questions, uh, please, on any of the works, please ask. Uh, I'm here till 11, so <laughs> you got me, and you can feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we can go to the next one. Now, as I started pushing it, I wanted to start playing with perspective. Now, you don't see traditional perspective as illustrators and artists know it in, in most Salish art design. Now you see the the red piece over there, which I call David and Goliath, which is old Bob or Vincent and Maximilian from the Black Hole series. And that there is more of a composition that you would see if it was a straight on piece from from most Salish artists. On the left, on the opposite side there, you have the Tron piece, and I wanted to play with perspective to show, can can we have depth? Can we have uh, foreshortening with, with form line and still be recognizable as that, be recognizable as a native art, or at least see the influence of it? This was also experiments with light and trying to see, playing with uh, different shades and variations to see if you could have, get something almost an electric feeling as I did with Tron and with the robot Mac, Maximilian in the background there. You know, the next piece. This here was the second cover that I did for Marvel, probably one of my more well-known ones up until re most recent. And it was for Red Wolf number one. Marvel, uh, my first, in, my first uh, thing with Marvel was right after I started working on G.I. Joe for IDW, which was my first comic book cover, Joe Quesada, uh, the head of Marvel, messaged me on Facebook and told me to get in touch with their talent liaison and to let them know that he emailed me and wanted to get me in their pool. So I did it. And for about a year there, I had to send them covers that I was doing for other companies, art shows that I was participating in, any works that might show a new skill or a new uh, style that I was playing with so they can have an idea, a greater idea of what I was capable of. And the first gig that I got from them actually was for the Age of Ultron. And I, w I did an art show for them. It was coinciding with the opening weekend of that film and it was down in LA at a, a pop art gallery that they were working with. But this piece here was the second cover that I did for him. And they, they hired me not only as the art, main cover artist for this, but they also wanted me to be the consultant because this was the first time they were bringing back their, uh, giving a Native American character his own book again. And they wanted to make sure it was authentic. Now, I don't think that most of the writers, Stan Lee, Sabasina, all those guys that used to work on these comics in the old days, I don't think they purposely meant any harm or disrespect they worked with what they had so a lot of the stereotypes that they seen were based off of film and television and any other uh things that didn't that only did a surface surface look at our culture hit that marvel wanted to correct that and make sure that anything that they were starting to do with native culture had some some had authentic authenticity and was respectful and that's why i was brought on this cover here, they uh, I sent them ten comps. Now traditionally I'll do three style, three real rough pieces. They they contacted me and said, okay, we uh, we really liked a lot, of, but we like the this one and we want these colors. And it was a Friday Friday morning. I was just heading to PAX. I was going to be a guest there, and they said, oh yeah. And said at we'd love it if it was nine o'clock. I was on the ferry. They said, can you? Uh, get us this by noon that or something rough by noon and and uh so because we want to go to press with this right away 
And I thought, oh yeah, maybe sure. And my boy said, oh yeah, you could do it, Dad. You could do it. We'll take we'll take the the booth and do all that stuff. And I did. So the piece, this red piece, I did in less than three hours. That was one of the fastest pieces I've ever done. <laughs> the, the piece next to it, it and and with this one here, you could see definitely start seeing the expressionist and imp, uh, imp, uh, uh, influences on my work. Now, on the right side is a cover for Moon Knight. And they again, they wanted me to create something fun and iconic for that. It was a chance for me to explore Egyptian hieroglyphics, which I think lend well to form line design, both being flat in presentation. Uh, the idea was that he was in a mental institution, a hero. So I thought, what if we make it look like the hieroglyphics are in the, somebody put them in, the, in there, in the institution on the rough walls stuff. So they go back in there and they see it. So that's the story. The, the hieroglyphics, the characters that you see underneath them actually say uh, uh, who who created it says Moon Knight and said who and the names of the the author, the guys who created him. So I have a question. Um, is there any um, or is there like a difference between um, like in art style between the different Salish tribes or um or is it more like kind of a broad or not like super broad but like more of a regional um art form that um all the salish tribes all kind of have in common well we have common shapes uh we you know there's the ovoid there's the the salmon trout eyes there's crescents there's uh trigons all those kind of shapes the split use are all common within in all Salish art, however, each region, each tribe has their own style, their own influence, their own interpretation of those shapes. Just like myself, I have my own style interpretation of these, and I've really pushed them. I feel that that are farther from them now. And that's gotten me some notoriety, but it also has gotten me some uh, pushback from some of my peers uh, that don't feel that that that's that's appropriate. I, however, feel that art is constantly growing is constantly evolving and you want to push it and you want to keep and to keep it alive you have to reinvent it sometimes you have to re we look at it and say okay what else can this be and that's and basically that's the motto of most of my work if you look at it is like what can this shape be what does this shape want to be does it want to be it, to me it wants to be more than what it once was it wants to it wants to come alive and and, and it wants to show that it's the potential it really all the potential it really has uh, uh simon simon uh yeah so i i just wanted to ask you uh i mentioned this in the chat as well but um i feel like it probably got lost um i i wanted to ask uh what is your opinion on people who are non-native using this style like as a native person like what do you how do you feel about about people who don't really have any connections to native americans using this in their art uh, that's a great question. Now, what I'm about to share with you is my own personal opinion. It is not reflective of everybody. I, I understand most of us have a different thing. My opinion on this is respect the culture, respect where it came from, and always make sure that you understand it and have a, a, a great understanding of where, where, what you're using and where and why you're using it. But to me, it's a lot like cooking, that you see great chefs that travel all over the world, and they, they, they pick what they think is the best from each region and they put it and use it in their own works, their own creations. And to me, that's the same thing with art that we take and we borrow from what we love and what we like and what we, what pleases us. And the same thing, I don't see that being any different from, from what I do. As you can see, there's many influences on my work. It's not just native art. It, there's many. And I would be a hypocrite if I said, you, I can do it, but you can't, you know, uh, I think for me is what are your intentions on creating the art? Are they simply from a monetary standpoint where you're looking to make money off of it? Or you're looking to get rich. I'm not, a, I'm not on board with that kind of sort of thing, but if you're looking to honor the shapes, you honor the culture that you're working with and making sure that that's well aware, well shown in your work that, uh, I don't have personally, I don't have a problem with that. 
but there are others that, yeah, they, they don't, they don't like that. And I've had situations where I've seen people do it. Now, I, the one time I did get angry with somebody about it, he was, uh, it was an artist from Oregon and it wasn't that he was doing it. It was that he was claiming he was the first to do it and that he was going to be a bridge between cultures and he was making these really, really big claims. And I felt it was disrespectful to the artists that came before him, the artists that are currently doing it and that he didn't do his research well enough. And he was an educated guy. He was everything. So I, I, I had some issues with that. But like I said, if, if you're being respectful to culture, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that, yeah, go for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We can go to the next one, please. Here's some, this here is for wraparound covers uh, for Transformers. My wife tends to think that she likes me doing Transformers the best simply because she thinks that the sh they, they, that my shapes work best with Transformers. This was very early work of, of mine. This was, but it was experiment. Like I said, I'm always pushing it and trying new things. And here I wanted to, I was playing with ambient light. And you could see the reflections on the surfaces there, the glows. That was new things that I was trying out and testing that I, I use today. Uh, this was for wraparound covers for the Transformer books. This one never got produced. The first one that I did for him was a huge, like 300 page book or it was $150 they wanted for the book. So they didn't sell a lot of them. So they ended up canceling the series after the first book. But you can see here that you can see that the influences that the Tron piece and the Maximilian piece had that before where I was working with light to, to try to get electric feeling you can see the evolution there taking place as well next one these are two separate co uh, covers one is the yellow one is for was for marvel it was for the new avengers it was a death of series and here they wanted me to come up with a a death for uh, Warpath, who was a, one of their mutants, uh, mutants from the X Force and X Men, they wanted me to come up with some fun, creative way to kill the character. And I love the old Turok covers. Uh, it, for those of you who know comics, the old Turok covers were fun. They're exciting. They use bright, bold colors. They always had these fantastic creatures, dinosaurs that Turok was fighting. And I thought I really wanted to do something in that vein, that genre. Uh, I wanted to create, however, I wanted to create a monster or a creature that was menacing yet had a familiar feeling. So what I took was two different creatures. I took the owl, which is harbinger of death for most native culture, and the uh, how how bird, which is a uh, the origin of mosquitoes, which is, has the long beak and the eyebrows and stuff like like that. And I wanted to, so I created this amalgam of a creature that, that he's battling and here you got some depth you got motion you got certain things again playing with with different different things different elements different textures the the right side was for a comic book called divinity which was one of my favorite comic series i got to work on which was a lot of fun the uh, they were cosmonauts who got sent into deep space after the U.S. landed on the moon. And when they came back, they encountered some kind of presence that gave them these um, these superpowers, that godlike powers. And I wanted to share, I wanted to create a piece that showed the, the female cosmonaut make her feel omnipotent and all-powerful. So I thought, what if I showed her in a star field that made that... Uh, to show that she was made up of the stars and had kind of that godly like feeling and presence. You can see that I use a lot of reds. I tend to favor a lot of reds and oranges. Uh, the red, uh, it just is a color I think that draws everybody and, but yellow and orange are two of my favorite colors to use with. Uh, I just like the warm feeling that those create. But I also go through, if you'll see, if you, if you go through my work, you'll see that I go through periods where there are certain colors that I tend to favor more and, and, and do that. 
um, I'm always always on the lookout for new influences and new new ways to treat and and share color. Color is a huge thing for me that that I want to to maximize that and give people th something that's familiar yet brand new, and that's important to me as a, as an artist. That, that those are always that those are explored to the fullest. Okay. These are some fun ones here, uh, a little bit more play. One was for Adventure Time comic book that I got to do, which I picked that con. I took that contract because my kids were huge Adventure Time bands. I've watched a couple episodes myself. I thought they were fun, but I wanted to do something for my kids. And here I thought it would be fun with Jake, the dog, and having Finn coming out of off his tongue was a lot like most of the traditional native art that you would see in the old days where you'd see uh, some creature like a bear or beaver or something like that. And they'd always be like, like that. They'd have something in their mouth, another creature in their mouth. Here, I wanted to do the same thing and honor that spirit. The other one on the, the left-hand side is for a book called Angel Catbird. And it was for a splash page that they asked me to do for their graphic novel. You can see it's a lot of my work too. I like mid-century modern. And so you can see some of the influences in there and the way I treat certain shapes. You can see the Chuck Jones feeling from the old Looney Tune cartoons of Tom and Jerry. Okay. While you're paused, Jeffrey, could you explain splash art and pin up and some of the different terminology about the different kinds of pages in a graphic novel? Yeah, yes. yeah, no, splash page is traditionally what you see most, what most people do when they draw art. Uh, it's usually a single, singular pose, an action pose that gets placed in a book. It usually is just, it could be a cover, like a, it could be used as a cover. Uh, it, it, it has one scene in it. Uh, every, a panel, it doesn't have any panels, doesn't, it's just, it's sharing one moment. Of, of action one moment in the story uh, and same thing with the covers it's one moment or it's one thing that's conveying what you're about to step into the book that you want to make sure you capture that you don't want to reveal the whole thing but you want to give enough just to pique the interest same thing with splash page you want to create something fun and interesting that's like that can be a standalone piece that you get the idea right away what you're looking at uh, the, the cover next to it was for Spectacular Spider-Man number 300. It was for the EMP when they had the Marvel exhibit there at, at the Museum of Pop. That was a commissioned cover for them in Marvel that was for there. They wanted to make sure they had a Seattle vibe to it, uh, but make sure that Spider-Man was, was was in there. And be able to work on Spectacular Spider-Man was was awesome, awesome moment. For me, I wanted to make sure that I captured as much of Seattle as I could in this, that if People came here, they walked away with something that was unique to our city that I love. Uh, you had in influences. I wanted to give it kind of a grungy feel, as you can see in the background and the treatment and, and the treatment to that. The uh, even threw in a little 12th man flag there on top of one of the buildings. I thought that was kind of a fun little nod to that. The uh, the cover next to it was for Ghostbusters. My daughter was a huge fan of that the the new Ghostbusters film, and so I I I commissioned I they were sharing that they, the IDW started to work on that, and I tweeted and said, "Hey, I would love to be part of that," and they were all excited. So they gave me an opportunity, and this was a cover that they the design that they picked, and I worked with it. Here you can see again me playing with more light and more uh, more movement of light, and how that behaves. Stylized and co stylized color of the characters and the shapes. I was, I was, my daughter was really happy about it. What I loved about this was that Paul Feige, uh, the director of the film, uh, emailed me and said and thanked me for it. Thought that uh, he was really excited to see how much time and thought that I put into it, and was really appreciative of the effort, which was a very, very cool thing for me. But again, here you see within the. The beams that are coming off there, you can see the form, you can see the split use in there again, which is pushing away, which is again the move where we have movement. Next slide. More covers. Uh, the left hand is from 
uh, Transformers versus Visionaries. And they wanted me to create the, the, the characters. These are characters from when I was growing up uh, in the 80s. They, uh, they use holograms and projectiles. They're kind of like witches, I guess. And they wanted me to create something that was fun with the Transformers. And I thought, what if we used sharks? Since sharks were her totem, I thought, what if it was like a, a feeding frenzy almost? So I, I designed that. I wanted to try to give a holographic look. It was pure energy. A lot of motion coming from her staff, as well as a transformer in the background there, which is Ironhide. And on the right side was for another uh, 70s, 80s comic, uh, the um, ROM and the Micronauts. And here, you, this and that piece was was kind of cool because that was one of the pieces that we used as a test for the uh, exhibit that I had at the Smithsonian. They printed that huge. Uh, uh, three foot by four foot piece of canvas. This for me, one of the tests when I went back to New York to see how it treated color because I really pushed some of the boundaries of the color gamuts on the, on that cover there. Um, you can see the designs. I started playing more with designs within designs within designs within the the main villain's armor there. Again, you start seeing more and more perspective and how I treat that, and I'm getting closer to more traditional illustration techniques, but still able to maintain the, the form line elements within that. Any, go ahead. And here are some more examples of the ways I'm const I'm trying to push things. Uh, the cover there on the left, that the Cybertron cover was for a Transformers travel poster series that they were doing uh, two years ago. They uh, contacted me, and I'd, I've done a lot. Of, I think Transformers is one of the ones I've done a lot of covers for. Uh, they wanted me to show Cybertron and uh, visiting that, so I thought, oh, wow, this is fun. The cool thing about this was when I was in seventh grade, we I don't know if they still do this anywhere else, watching, but we had this, this project called Eighth Continent, and we had to create a continent uh, and name it. We had to populate it. We had to basically put everything into it. It was world building at... World built my first experience with world building. I did my own Transformers when I was a kid, and uh, I it was the only A plus I ever got, and I still have the paperwork from it. And I was really cool because I got to email my teacher after I started doing these and sent these covers and said, "Look, because I created travel brochures for that, which was the which really pushed me over for that A plus that I got." And so to see that I was doing that as an adult and show how far it's come was a real it was it was a moment of pride for me and I, and I was really proud to show my teacher how much of an influence they had. A lot of the works that I do is, is nice because my, I think a lot of my teachers can see that they, they did impact my life, that they did have uh, what they did and what they shared with me growing up is still evident today. This one here was, I wanted to give a, create a 70s sci-fi feel uh, that you would see from like John Berkey or Chris Foss that you typically see in the late sixties and, and seventies that was created that had kind of that rugged, loose uh, expressionist feel, but you can still, it's still recognizable. My favorite part of this was the, uh, the light trails created from the propulsion systems, how, how they move when they're moving towards the planet. If you look at Cybertron closely enough, you'll see that it's actually salmon, salmon trout eye in there, but it's layered within depth. So you have, because it's a mechanical planet, you can see the, the mechanisms that are going in there. The cover to the opposite side was my first official Star Trek cover, which I, I'm a huge Trekkie, I've been Trekkie for over 30 years. Uh, they uh, gave me some concepts. Uh, they told me the, the, the bulk of the story and it's about Seven of Nine. And if anybody's familiar with the character Seven of Nine from Voyager, uh, they know that a Raven plays, plays within her story. And I thought, well, what if we had a playoff of Raven stealing light instead of the light being the sun, which engine becomes the sun, it's the light re re regeneration uh, light from, from the Borg. And showing this, and instead of stealing light, it, it's uh, Voyager. And this one was a fun one for me. Oh, the next.
Um, I had a quick question. Um, I was wondering what your process is and like what software you use or if you ever use Procreate. I, I, I use uh, Illustrator and I use Photoshop. And uh, to be honest, I use a mouse. <laughs> I've used a mouse this whole time. It's uh, what I'm familiar with. My sons keep trying to get me to move over to pen because I draw traditional still. I do a lot of my thumbnails and sketches on in sketchbooks. Uh, and then because that does still save time. Thumbnailing is a huge thing. Uh, you never really want to jump in, jump in without, without warming up. And to me, that's war before you do any kind of exercises uh, that, that any kind of work you want to be warmed up. And thumbnailing is one of those fun things that I do. I, and that's just mainly composition. They're real rough. They're real loose, and you only you only put a few seconds of thought into each one, but you want to try to exhaust the options. So when you get to the computer, when you get to whatever meeting you're trying to that you're going to be working in, that you you now it, it's only you only have to worry about execution and not the idea itself. Uh, I start out with illust. I, so I start out with pencil and paper and then jump into Illustrator, do the forms in Illustrator. Then if they require painting, texture, or anything else like that, I bring that into Photoshop. My sons, however, they use different programs. I know they uh, use a lot of the, the, the newer uh, drawing programs. Uh, I, I have not yet used those. Do any of your kids use Autodesk? I, you know, I don't think so. Uh, I'd have to talk to my oldest and my oldest son. He just graduated Northwest College of Art not too long ago. And he uses programs that I have no idea. He uh, actually does a lot of the animation for me, the projects that we've worked on together. He's the animator for it. I, I'll do the illustrative work and he does, <laughs> does that. Do you ever make your thumbnails available? The, seeing that process of moving from thumbnail through all those stages would be a, a lovely experience if you ever did that. I haven't, but I can honest, but I can say that uh, as long as we're keeping this a secret amongst everybody here, <laughs> that I'm in a, doing another show with the Smithsonian. And part of that will be that they'll be featuring and sharing are my sketchbooks for a new project that I'm working on that they, so people can see, see my thought process. So that will, and that will be in Washington, D.C., I believe next year. And that's actually going to be the first time. Uh, my sketches uh, are really loose. I understand them. The notes, I understand them. Uh, my artwork is the cleanest thing about me. <laughs> uh, I am, I, 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 I tend to like the ideas. I'm an idea person. And so I'm constantly moving. My mind is moving so fast that I just want to get the idea out. And it is, uh, so my, the drawings reflective of that as well as my notes. I understand them when I go back to them, but somebody who isn't familiar with my work or they might not see what I see, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm looking forward to being able to share some of that process with, with people. Thank you. Uh, what we're seeing here is I, a tradition typically I do a uh, new Seahawks design every year is something that's influenced by the Seahawks. Uh, my family, my cousins growing up the reservation, everybody loves the Seahawks. So uh, I try to create something new for my friends and family. This here was a fun take. Uh, it's got very much of an art deco feel to it. Uh, the movement, the shapes moving into it. You get, I create kind of a, I, I really start playing with, uh, not with tricks, but, uh, visual uh, what I'm, I'm trying to create here is uh, tricks visual tricks uh, optical illusions with stuff so your eyes see certain things but then you pull back and you see more from it that you hadn't seen previously that you realize certain shapes are connected and they pull together but it doesn't lend to that Now, when I design for like t-shirts or anything like that, I tend to stick with minimal color shapes. I don't like necessarily putting prints on t-shirts and I don't like putting t-shirt designs on prints. I feel like when I'm designing anything that's gonna be on clothing or a comic book cover, that they're, they're, they're designed for a comic book cover, that they're designed for a t-shirt. I, I don't like, 
uh, throw, just throwing stuff on things to me, it, it, it's a waste of space sometimes that you, you've designed for certain elements that, and you design for certain ways to be presented and it loses its impact. Some people might not agree with that, but that, that's my own personal opinion. So anytime I do t-shirt design, it stays as a t-shirt design. Anytime I do a cover, I will do a print of it, but I won't put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> Okay. This year is for my show, uh, Bold Americans, and I wanted to, uh, this is my first gallery show at the Stonington Gallery, my first solo solo gallery show that I had where they were selling all my work. Um, I'm, a, I'm big into space and space exploration and the idea of hope. We've been living in such hard times the last five years uh it's just crazy and I, I mean if we go back it's even harder but the last five years things have really come to a boiling point and it's a lot of this versus us versus them right versus left red versus blue republican democrat uh, i wanted to create a show that reminded everybody that we're all americans give people a sense of patriotism and a sense of uh that wasn't red or blue that was red white and blue that wasn't it wasn't hate filled or or they just the reminder that you know when we work together we can do great things and we have accomplished great things um, the apollo space program was one of them and going to the moon and here i wanted to capture that uh, here we use some of my favorite color palettes again the oranges and the blues together complementary colors a pop uh, showing showing the saturn rocket breaking away from the Earth's gravity there. You can start seeing that there's a little bit of a dip in it. So you can see that it's hitting the grab, it's hitting zero gravity. So it's gonna start losing a little bit. So it plays with your eye. The movement, the dots, the dot fields that you see going underneath or going from the ship. That's something that came, uh, that I started playing with it, adding here recently. Because as a kid, uh, I don't know about any of you or any of the guys, Anytime I draw an airplane or anything like that, you'd always have those little dots dot, 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 flying across, show the movement. And I've always liked that. I thought visually, I thought I'd give it a shot. So a lot of my airplane uh, and the, the flight things that I created for this Bold Americans included that, included that element, which is also a play off of some of the patterns that you see in traditional native art using the same thing. Most of the art that I create for my gallery shows is hope inspired because I want people to think and remind them of who we are and what we're capable of. That that uh, I work in the business of heroes, but we're all heroes if we want to be. We're all heroes of our own story, and I want to remind people of that that we can we can have a positive impact in our in our own sphere of life, and and if we if we each do that. Think about the, that when you take that little step, how much bigger of an impact that will be uh, when you take us, when you look back at things, you take a step back. If everybody's doing it, then we're all doing it. And it's a much bigger movement. Okay. Some more pieces from that show. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen there, the Red Tails. Uh, I I was fortunate enough when I was working at the agency that I had I had a uh, I had a client that worked with with the military and we did a special uh, interview and I got to do an interview with some of the, the original Tuskegee Airmen and I never forgot the words that they were sharing of when they were coming home and how they had to go on different ships and they had to when they were coming back from overseas that their friends the, the their white friends would be and everybody was not black got to get off in new york while they'd have to go down farther to like parts of new jersey because they weren't welcome for the, the parade and the welcome home they didn't want them there considering but considering all that they'd done officers and everything tuskegee airmen never lost a plane never lost a bomber a bomber that when they escorted them and they have the distinction of saying that and yet they were treated like second class citizens as a result of it when he was sharing his stories i kept crying and I remember thinking that all I kept wanting to do was say, oh, sorry, I wasn't there. 
And, but all I wanted to do is keep saying how sorry I was. Here I wanted to honor honor that that with them. And then we have the Apollo 11 there, which was a lot more fun. And that was just a fun way. I, I brought that out for uh, the anniversary of the, the lunar landing. I wanted to capture everybody. The Eagle has landed. I wanted to capture not just uh, Neil and Buzz, but also Michael Collins as he orbited the moon while they were on the surface. Again, you can see this one. That one has more of a causal element in the way of the shapes, especially within the uh, the eagle. Okay. Star Wars fun. I love doing Star Wars here. You can see more of the uh, mid-century modern elements within this piece here. The cantina scene with Han Solo and stuff. I I. The Star Wars was probably the biggest impact on my life growing up. I was uh, three when I saw it, and it dominated my life as a child. I mean, most kids that grew up in the 70s and 80s will tell you that. And the toys were a huge part of that. We didn't have DVDs. We didn't have uh, – VHS didn't come out for at least another six years. It wasn't in every home. So we didn't get to watch them all the time. So we had our toys. We had our records and our comics, and that's how we kept things alive. And – the characters that we see in here were based off the action figures and not necessarily how they looked on film because those to me were how I seen it and, and wanted to have fun with it. Go to the next one. This here is Mothra, a Mothra design that I did. Uh, again, we get closer to more traditional native, but again, playing with color and optical illusions, I uh, wanted to create something visually fun. I love kaijus and big monsters and just wanted to create something fun and elegant with this. And uh, this is actually one of my favorite designs that I've done. It might not be my best, but it, it's definitely one of my favorites. Why is it one of your favorites, Jeffrey? Uh, maybe it's the colors. Uh, like I said, it's a color palette that I touched. Uh, one of my instructors once told me later on uh, about a couple of years ago, he said that he noticed that I use a lot of these colors in my designs that I tend to favor the oranges and the yellows and the brown, the mustards. And he says it's because I grew up in the seventies and he said that uh, hmm. the color palette was uh, probably something, a port in my life that I really loved. And he thought that that's why I resonate with those colors. And he's probably right uh, when he said that. But I, what I like about this is the movement of this piece. There, it, it is a stagnant piece, but there's movement in it with your eyes and with the shapes that they pull your eyes around and it's circular and it puts, puts, brings to the point of Mothra's head there. And, and you still see a, a moth, a butterfly. You know, I, I, I didn't pull, let me see. Let me see if there's any questions here. Uh, man, I got to tell you, these are some incredible comments that you guys have given me. Uh, I'm honored. We'll make sure we save those and send them to you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so I got, you can go to the next one. This is from my net last, my last show that I had back in May. And this was, again, keeping up with the theme of hope. Like I said, the galleries, uh, this is for a better tomorrow. And this works inspired by the 1962 World's Fair. Now, we all know the, we all know the Space Needle, but I don't know how many knows the story behind it and how it wasn't going to be a space show originally. It was going to be a Western show. But then Sputnik launched and America was scrambling to get to space. They, we didn't want to lose the, the space race and, and the arms race. And so they changed the theme of that. And by doing so, really altered this, the, the skyline of Seattle forever, transformed the city with that, with the Sputnik transformed us. And I wanted to honor that. I wanted to honor the hope that that, that show had, and as well as the style of that era, trying to keep within the modified color palette of that era and uh and have fun but still have fun with it and have that that cheeky 
60s feel vibe to it that you you would see back in that era that mid-century modern feel the the moon on the side there where he's smiling down watching the progress of the future city of seattle uh what i i scalp the edges there where you see the split use coming in with the forms that was something new that i just started doing with these pieces here that uh to me created more interesting feeling and created more movement within something that was just a square you you break it up and i'm always trying to see if there's ways to do that i like to pooch out of the 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 break out of the the boxes on these things and and give your eyes something to, to pull you towards i don't traditionally like doing something that's just you know normal outside of the box i, I try to, to give it something new yep that is kind of a jetson style world my uh the cars all that Oh, cool. Thanks. Next one. So this here is to show some other stuff that I do. Uh, besides the comic, comic book art, the gallery art that I do, as well as the public art installation, I can't share any of those yet because there's still a multiple development uh, in, in Seattle. I'm designing right now for a new apartment complex, uh, these screens that are gonna be going up seven stories that would be metal and there's six, no, there's 17 of them. And I can't wait for people to see that, especially the colors that were in this one of my first, be my first metal works, as well as a sculpt, a large uh, 24 foot sculptural piece that I designed for the city of Ballard that will be downtown on the waterfront, things like that um, I do, and along with the murals. The other work I do is traditional graphic design and branding. Uh, here was a chance to really have an impact in Indian country on the, the census this year, as well as the vote and how important that was. I wanted to create something that felt traditional and, but yet contemporary, that felt cool, but not contrived. That you could put it on a shirt, you could put it on these things and not feel funny wearing it. Uh, whenever I design anything, I try when I, the biggest thing I always ask myself, would I buy this? Would I wear this? Uh, same thing with all my art. Everything that I create, I create with me in mind first. Uh, if I like it and I can tell you why I like it, then I can tell you and sell it to the client. Because if you don't believe in your work, if you don't have the reasons, you don't have reasons and logic to explain your decision making when you design something, how do you expect your clients to have faith in that? So you always got to remember that you have to believe in your work first. Uh, don't that, that, and you have to like it. If you don't like it, don't turn it in because it's missing something. Okay. And these here are some of my latest works for Marvel uh, for the Native American Heritage Month which was a huge thing. Uh, it was two years in the making. I started talking to Marvel during my exhibit at the Smithsonian and I'd worked with them on that and, and they were very helpful. But then I kept saying, what can we do more? Can, you know, take advantage of this and see, you know, can we, we should honor the Native American Heritage Month and do that and just, and originally only started out with me doing a single cover. And I did a test for them and showed them what I would do. And it was the Spider-Man there in the, the top right hand corner from the poster. It ended up becoming, as a result of those conversations over the last years, ended up becoming nine covers that I did for them and a poster and the book, The Marvel Visions, which uh, is uh, Indigenous Voices, which was the first in comic book history. And to be able to represent not just my own region, but all of Native America being chosen to do that and to share my work is one of the greatest honors I've ever had. Uh, I still don't can't believe that 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 Marvel did that and had that much faith in my ability. Uh, as an artist, it's humbling and at the same time scary that you you know, uh, you, especially as you're creating these, you're, it's a lot of fun making art. I mean, that's why I do it. But at the same time, you know, people are investing money in this and it's a business and that they have that kind of faith in you and faith is, is a scary thing. It's daunting. 
but also when you're having doubt you got you, that's also a good thing to remind yourself that they wouldn't that is a business that it is uh they do have responsibilities and if they're putting their faith in you there's a reason they're putting their faith in you and so it, it's kind of a double-edged sword that way i'm gonna interrupt just for a moment taking putting my huh? teacher hat on to say if you need to leave uh by all means go on to the next thing you have to do in your life and Jeffrey will be with us for at least for another eight minutes. So stay. Yeah, here. And if you want to stay for a few more minutes longer, that's, that's okay. Uh, we've got started late, so I don't mind, mind doing that. And we're almost done with the show. I think we only got maybe one or two slides or maybe none. I'm not sure of. Uh, let's see. So the covers, how I picked these was I gave them a list of my favorite characters and they came back and said, okay, if they, okay, we'll do this one and this one. And then they come back and they said, okay, let's do these two too okay, let's add these. Can you do this one also? And it's like, yeah, I, I can. And as it is right now, uh, I've never been busier. Uh, Marvel's kept me super busy. I've been working on some new projects for them. They're equally as big as this here uh, in, in the months ahead that I'm pretty excited to talk about be, that people will be seeing. Uh, again, trying to push the limits. If people have seen this, what will they see next? And what's the next extension of that? So trying, it's not just with colors, but how the shapes perform and how they're laid out. Okay. And be continued. Like I said, I, I have multiple projects currently right now uh, with the city of Seattle, uh, the Climate Pledge Arena. I'm designing uh, a mural for them, a large scale mural. I have murals and artworks all over. If you go to Snoqualmie Casino, uh, their VIP entrance, I designed the, the entrance I created, uh, wallpapers that totally wraps the room so it's an immersion experience when you walk in. There's the moon on the ceiling and waterfalls, stylized waterfalls and prayer walls on the other side. Uh, if you go to the, the Muckleshoot tribe, they have a Veterans Memorial Park, which I designed all the graphics and the waterfall, uh, the water, uh, water uh, water fountain that they have there with the, the for their veterans um, if citizen m hotel in downtown seattle there next to amazon that i designed the eye of prime which was a 124 foot mural that completely wraps around their main entrance on the inside there their concierge and goes all the way around and that's an ode that is my ode to positive uh representations of artificial intelligence and media um, work like I said talk about the project of 12th and Yesler and uh, other projects that I can't discuss yet but I'm a pretty busy guy and I don't see that slowing down it actually it feels like it every day I'm getting new opportunities that I never dreamed of working with people that I had never dreamed of and uh, being able to work with fan uh, as being a fan and being able to work with some of my heroes has been one of the things that unexpected pleasures of what I do um, as being a Star Trek and not just working on the Star Trek, but being able to work with some of the cast and some of the crew of that show. Uh, I just worked with Leonard Nimoy's family. I did a pro bono piece for them for his, his LLAP shop, which will all the proceeds uh, will be going towards COPT research at UCLA. And because uh, Leonard Nimoy was my, was one of my heroes, and I want and he's believe it or not, he saved my life more times than once. I believe uh, at least my sanity, especially as a teenager. Uh, the thing I think with with artists most when you're working is you're going to have times where you might not sell anything, you might not get any movement, you might not hear from anybody, you might not get any feedback from your work but don't lose heart. Remember why you were an artist to begin with. Remember why you're creative or in any field, any field. Why did you choose this? Why did you choose that field? Why did you, why did you take this path and keep and remind yourself of that every time things get bad, every time things get a little dark, or a little scary and every choice, every decision you make, remember the goals that you have and ask yourself, is this, getting me towards my goal or is it a distraction because there are plenty of distractions 
Uh, for me, I found social media was one of the biggest distractions. You get to the point where you're online so much talking to people and interacting with them. You think you're supposed to do that. But the reality was I'm an artist uh, yeah. and I should be making art, not online as much. So this last, I'd say since lockdown, I've really tried to pull myself away from social media like like I was and, and do that. And then jobs remembering the jobs that I want to do. Remember the clients. That's one of the best parts about working for yourself is that you now have control of who you work with and who you work for. That you don't, if you don't like a cause, you don't have to work with it. Uh, when you work in an agency, you don't necessarily have that choice. Do folks have questions they'd like to ask Jeffrey at this moment? And um, just anyone, do you think we still need to have the PowerPoint. Ah, there we go. Um, so you can um, pin Jeffrey and he will be full screen for us. Do you guys have questions you'd like, any further questions you'd like to ask? I have a question. <clears throat> um, so you talked a little bit about the murals that you've done and I saw you did one at, um, I think the Kingston high school as well yeah which I saw um, but I was wondering if you could paint a mural anywhere where would it be oh, that's a great oh man that would be something uh really I would the Johnson Space Center Kennedy Space Center would be uh for me would be the nerd in me would say that's probably where I would love to the most um <clears throat> having a chance for my work to inspire not just the astronauts and engineers, but all the personnel to remind them visually why they're doing what they're doing uh, would be uh, the ultimate for me. Uh, I would love to have something in the Museum of Modern Art or the Louvre. I mean, that, that, those are huge things that, you know, you never know, but it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility. But, you know, as an artist, you got to be realistic about it. Uh, any artist will say that you like that. But for the most part, those Johnson Space and Kennedy Space Center would be the ones that I would want to do. Did you go to North or Kingston? No, I didn't. I just saw that mural. On oh, okay. The oh, no. well, yeah, my wife, she's actually a librarian there, too. So uh, she wasn't when I did the mural, but uh, she worked for the school district at the time. Now, she, now she's in library, so she gets to see that every day. <laughs> Wait, which mural is it? I went to Kingston. I did the one in the library. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, That's what year did you graduate? Um, so I actually, I only went there for my first two years of high school, and then I moved to Colorado, and now I'm back in Seattle. But... Um, 2019 was was the year that I graduated. Yeah, my wife worked there, uh, Christina. She used to work in the athletic department, and then she then she was attendance, and then she was a uh, librarian. So, wow. Yeah, I when you said that you were uh, uh, the the Sklalem tribe. That's um that's in Hansville, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, okay. I, yeah, and that was actually my first big piece that I did was that as the school district and then and the Squamish tribe helped pay for that, and that was actually my first big job that I did, and that was awesome to be able to do that. I'm also Squamish Duwamish. I'm registered Squalam, but uh, I'm also of their descendancy. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was a great thing. Now I've tried painting murals. I uh, the, when I was at the agency, they wanted me to paint this big mural on a wall and it was 45 feet and thing was I had a I had a job to do so they wanted me to go up and paint while I wasn't working well I worked 99% of the time so it never got done and so yeah. they had to painting over it at the agency but it was a map of a uh, world map that I was creating I love making maps maps was one of my favorite things at that agency to do was was creating a new way to show maps and, and do that uh, the boy in me, uh, looking for adventure, the Indiana Jones feeling. Did you, um, have you ever gone on like, um, the canoe journey or anything like that? I have not. I've done canoes, you know, when we were building them and gone out in our own bay in them, but I've never done the journey itself. Uh, 
I just with, with the family and what I and with my work, it's just never been something that I I could do. Yeah. Uh, I have, you know, I do work do things with my tribe. I was actually, when I went to art school, I was on tribal council. I was the youngest uh, official ever elected to the council at 24. Wow. And uh, it was politics was also got me, reminded me of why I wanted to be an artist. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was a good learning experience, but yeah. definitely not one I care to repeat. Yeah, I, I, um. I don't know if I said this already, but I actually grew up in Suquamish. I went to Suquamish Elementary. Um, and so, like, um, and, like, a lot of my friends growing up were, like, part of the Suquamish tribe. So I thought it was, like, really cool that, like, you know, it was like, hey, you're from around there, you know? Yeah, that's in your good company. I got a lot of friends there. I uh, go down to Suquamish Elementary, actually, and talk to the kids there, uh, talk about the art, much watered-down version of what I have here Uh they get the same glazed over look on their eyes that I see on some of the screens. Cause I know I can go on and on and on about certain things. So, uh, but yeah, I, nice to you. Do awesome. other folks yeah. have questions they'd like to raise for Jeffrey? I had a quick question. Um, speaking of murals, you uh, mentioned that you were doing a piece in Ballard. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just from the area. So I was hoping to yeah. keep an eye out for that. Yeah, so they're building a new water pump station uh, down downtown there by uh, Shilshul, okay, and yeah. so I they the it just got everything got approved. Uh, we just got the email yesterday, and uh, and I'd been working on this project for two years. Uh, I the design itself that I created for the sculptural piece is not a totem pole, but it's not not a totem pole too. I guess it's it's. I'm trying to come up with my own feel and look for 3D, which is a jump from what I do for traditional. How do I make my art look three, give it dimension and depth? Because when you look at form line design and carvings, you can see they're related, but they're totally different, different things that there's different rules for it. And when I make the, when I make the, what may making the jump into 3D, I'm making new rules for myself, how, you know, making sure that I set, set at least some guidelines for myself on right so everything makes sense and this here is the first large-scale piece that i dimensional piece that i'm really excited about i can't wait for people to see what it has gone through three different designs and uh this final one i'm really proud of i i'm really excited for people to see what what it is and the story that i wrote for it there's a, there's a story that goes along with the with it and the architect firm and stuff uh, is taking that story and they're expanding on it as far as part of the project itself, where it will be incorporating it in the building structure that they're creating as well as, as that, that kind of went beyond what the original scope of the work was, but they loved what I did. So I'm pretty that for, and that should be ready in about three years. I think uh, everything that I'm working on seems like it's two, three years away. The, the climate pledge arena uh, actually should be done next year that will be up in, in next year and I'm actually talking with them about doing another mural for them so uh, we'll we'll see how that goes other folks I wanted to go back to the idea that you share in your bio that you are telling stepping into the work of storytelling mm -hmm. that has always been a part of most cultures, certainly your culture. Mm -hmm. And then the tension that we talked about, you talked a little bit about it, but that you're using form line in new and different ways. And I just wondered if you could share more about how ancestors and elders and, um, you know, traditionalists address that with you, support you, question it, help you along? What's that relationship like? Well, it, it, it's mixed. Uh, it depends on where. Now, most of the, a lot of the elder artists that I've met, they've been very supportive of me. Uh, when they see it, they, they, it's not what they would do, and they understand that but they like the the attention and the light that I'm bringing to native art that uh, and, and showing and seeing that kids are excited about it. 
that to me is one of the the biggest bonuses I, I see is that native kids are starting to see that there's more potential for it. You don't just have to draw uh, what was been traditionally drawn over centuries, which is really hasn't changed much. Uh, I'm showing them that you can draw what you want to draw with it uh, and, and just, you know, take the same pieces, the same shapes, remember why they're being used and use them appropriately. There are others that feel that my shapes, uh, that I'm diluting the work, that uh, I'm, I'm creating a watered down version that will could corrupt some artists growing up. Uh, and, and pure and and I tell people I break the rules. I know why I'm breaking the rules. I don't just do it just because. Uh, I tell I'm sure let people know that this isn't pure form line design. I let them know why it's not pure form line design. I'm of mixed heritage, and the work that I create is of mixed heritage and it's mixed voices. I create works that basically I want to have fun with and uh, and I want to see. And uh, if that inspires and others is great if it brings back negative negative feedback which i get occasionally it's not a whole lot uh most of the time it's how i how i make my shapes like my ovoids i get really i get a lot of comments from my ovoids because it's not the traditional and and if you look at an ovoid from canada from say british columbia and you look at an ovoid from alaska and you look at an ovoid from uh say puyallup they're all going to be different they're all going to be different, and mine is no is no less than that. Uh, the support I get, like I said, I get some really good support. My biggest fear was David Boxley. When I seen him, I was really scared because he's a traditionalist. David's belief is that he wants people to see his work, and you put it next to something that was in the Burke Museum, and you couldn't tell the difference. That they they look like they could have been made by the same artist, same day, same era. Uh, so I was a little bit nervous about what he said, but he was actually very excited. He says he was really proud of me. He said that you make it your own. He said that, you know, I'm really proud of what you're doing with it. And when he gave me his sign off on it, it was really good. And then seeing the different museums and people like yourselves that get help giving that my art credibility. And, and I appreciate that. I didn't set out to make any controversy with any of this. Like I said, when I started doing this, this was just for me. This was just for have fun. Never did I expect that it would lead to any of the opportunities that I have, any of the uh, places that I've gone. It was just a chance for me to express myself. And that's, that's still what I do today uh, and try not to lose sight of that, that if I start losing sight of that and start, and then I'm creating work for the art for the wrong reason. and it loses its purity to me and taints it. And I, I'm, I've been really good about that. Cause for me, uh, I'd never want to see a blind piece of paper and say, and see nothing. I want to see all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't done that in a long time. And when you go to art school, it kind of ruins you a little bit. It, it's good for you and kind of bad for you at the same time. Before I went to art school, I was always drawing whatever, whenever I wanted. When I went to, after I graduated, I thought, I had to have clients to draw. I had to draw specific things and for specific reasons and just didn't do it for the fun of it. Mm. And I really missed that. And now the work that I do for the most part, I'd say it's 90, 90% 90 fun and 10% work. And I think your own sort of um, integrity with how and why you do the pieces you do, maintaining mm. the need to love what you're doing i think that speaks in the work and i think that feeds your you know the ongoing success which what a wonderful set of circumstances to live with and i know you worked really hard to find it get there continue it so it's just glorious to watch it all happen and to then get to sit with you and have you tell us what i'm not somebody who glazes over what mm -hmm. each one is how each one is pushing the envelope for you and how, yeah. what you're trying. And, and it's just been a lovely, lovely experience. Well, one of the things David taught me, uh, he taught me more than form line design. He was, before I met him, my teachers always told me my biggest thing, my, my biggest struggle in art school was that I rushed things that they said that I had my instructor said I had great ideas, 
but my execution was always lacking because I rushed things. Uh, working with David really changed that because I was, when I was, he was having me draw the same shapes over and over and over again until I could do it blindfolded almost. And when I was doing his finish work, I was always very extremely careful with it. And I didn't rush through it because I knew that this was his livelihood and that if I messed up, I'm taking food out of his, his refrigerator, food off his plate. And I didn't, I did not want to do that, especially for a man who was doing me the favor and teaching me and, and sharing with me. Uh, that, that was a big thing for me. They also, it, it was just, it gave me a chance. It, it taught me patience and taught me to really look at things. David also used to always tell me, you're only as good as your last work. So I always try to remember that is this with, especially with, with commission jobs, I want more work. So I got to make sure that when people hire me, that they're getting their, getting something fresh, something new, and that it's not something that they'd seen before, but they could see the same hand created it, but it, it's, it's different enough to where they know they're getting something unique for themselves. I want to make sure anyone else with a question has a chance to ask, and then Hi. perhaps it's time to let you go. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I have a, like, a, just personal questions. And um, I'm uh, just really recently started to um, paint and find out I really love art. Do you have mm -hmm. any suggestions for the really, really beginners? And I'm pretty old, right? <laughs> Start pretty late. Yeah, um, I recently have uh, two boys, and I, I'm 34, and I, uh, I couldn't sleep at night time because then I just, um, I start to, my friends give me a lot of pain, and I start to play with it and just, just play with it. And one day my husband said, maybe you can take some classes. And this is my first classes. So I'm still not confident enough because I start very late. Mm -hmm. I say, and I'm from a different country, and um, I really, if, and I uh, really appreciate your very real and honest here. So I want to ask these yeah. questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, first of all, I, I want to tell you, you're not old at all. Uh, 34 <laughs> is not even, you're still very young, and <laughs> I've been there. Uh, I, you know, um, I was in my mid thirties when I started painting again, just, just like yourself. And it was just for, just for myself. And if you, you remind if you keep to that, you rem remind, remember why you're doing it and keeping it, keeping it for yourself and not letting other influences come into that, that will taint that idea that you, you know, you, the enjoyment of you're doing it for, for pleasure. You're doing it for fun. And to remember that, that, not to be hard on yourself or look at the, you see, I think a lot of people have a hard time, artists in particular, we have a tendency to look at the, the person next to us and, and especially in art school saying, oh, wow, I can't draw that or I can't paint that, I can't sculpt that. Uh, but the reality is you don't have to. You create your, we each unique, we each have our own voices and it's your style to me is more important than your technique. Technique is good and you should learn it as much as possible because the, the more techniques you understand, the more uh, skills that you pick up will, will help you be, be better at expressing yourself. But your style and, and your own voice is your own and you should never compare that to anybody else's that uh, each, each, each thing that's ever impacted your life is influenced and shown through your art the choices of color, the choices of shape, the choices of composition, everything is, the, the subject material is all based on what you have experienced, uniquely experienced. And don't let, don't let anything else taint that for you. Uh, keep, keep drawing, keep painting, find new things. Look at, go look at our history. For me, it's, if you want to learn, I found for me was if I, if, I liked Picasso. I wanted to not just learn about Picasso. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn about who influenced Picasso and who influenced them. So I'd go back two or three generations when I was doing my study in here back in my thirties uh, of who, of how they come to their conclusions. For me, I always talk about 
try to find the root idea of why a person, the creative person was doing what they're doing. Don't copy their style. Don't copy their, their execution or anything, but find out why they were doing what they're doing and then say, okay, this is why they're doing it. How is my version of that in line with that? That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you so much. I started to cannot stop to look at YouTube. I see so many artists, they have their own type of style. Yeah. And I just, I don't like copy and I don't like, but I see some of, I see why they're doing this. And I yeah. pick some of this and that is, is, I can't find my style yet because I just yeah. began. Yeah, just, no, and, and you won't, and you won't, because you're just starting out. You, you still are experimenting. That, that, that to me is, I feel like art history is something that should be taught first it, it, with just like color, color theory and composition. It should be right there at the very beginning because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You're, you're, you're not, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, for me, my, when I was in art school, I took it my, towards my later half of, of my program. And I'd wish that I would took it earlier because I grew as an artist once I took history of design and art history. Art history wasn't a requirement at the Art Institute. I took it because I, you know, I, I love, I'm a history buff, but also I figured you, I wanted to learn and, and see what everybody else is doing and know that expose myself to art that I might not be exposed to. Because before I went to art school, I was, I was strictly comic book guy. I drew traditional comic book style stuff and all of my work was good it would never have been good enough to be in the comic books. I, I not ashamed to admit that uh, what got me to comic books is finding my own voice and finding a unique way of sharing that in a way that appeals to a broader audience. And, and, and luckily, lucky for me, what, you know, that's, that's, you know, that people like my work. I, I'd still be making it if I wasn't though. That's the thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, and good luck with your work. Thank you very much. Yeah. One last question, or have we have we asked everything we need to? I'm sure we'll think of many more questions later. And if anybody has questions, you can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on my website. You can email me questions. I'd uh, be glad to answer them. I might not answer them right away, depending on my workload. Um, I try, uh, I feel like once I start answering emails, I get pulled away from the work and uh, is a totally different mindset. It takes me back to get my rhythm of, of what I'm doing. But I will, will do that uh, and be glad to help and answer any questions. We've all been, we've all started out at different points in our careers, different points of who we are and I'd be glad to lend my advice to where, you know, the best of my ability. Anyways, I don't have all the answers. Uh, it might not even be the best answer, but, you know, I will try. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity today, in particular, and your patience as we muddled through all the difficult bits. Um, I'm so glad we did and we got there and we all got to hear you, learn with you, and just marvel at the range of your work. So a lovely, well, thank lovely you. visit. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words. I appreciate everybody giving me a time. Time is the most precious commodity we all have. And the fact that you were all willing to spend two hours here with me, listening to me and listening to my art uh, is mm -hmm. a great honor and a great privilege. So thank you. Uh, I hope that I not only entertained, but gave you some insight into yourselves and hope that your work um, it, it, it impacts your work and your and your own in, in, in your own career. Uh, we all we're like I said, uh, we're all artists, and we're all part of that fraternity that stems back to the people first painting on cave 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 walls thousands of years ago, and we're still storytellers. Ultimately, we're all storytellers. What's the story you want to tell? What's your story? Share that story. That's what you want to do. share. What you know. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to be, uh, don't try to write or draw stories that you don't know. Draw what you know and draw what you love and it will reflect in your work. As it does in yours. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. We'll Thank let you. Uh, let you go and 
uh, we'll be in, I'll be in touch in a variety of other ways, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and we'll definitely forward you the, the chat and all the- I would, I appreciate that. There were so many nice, I didn't get a chance to look at those. Uh, of course not. I apologize yeah. for that. Uh, I, I, I appreciate every kind word and every, and, and the effort it took to make those. So thank you. Yeah. And to quote my favorite Vulcan, Ah, oh yes that's great back at you <laughs> yeah if i can make my fingers my arthritic hands do that still. yeah no i you know as a kid when uh, like i said I, i'm a nerd i uh, i used to have to put i i would put my fingers in there to force my hands to do that when i was a kid same thing with my eyebrows i could raise my eyebrows up because i thought Sp i liked the way spock did it like i said i'm i'm a, <laughs> i'm a nerd it's gotten so, you it's been yeah grand. yeah all right I'm going to, um, I, I, anyone else want to say a final anything? Thanks. Jane, thank you, Catherine. Thank you. All of you. Thank you. Well, Lovely. stay healthy, stay safe. Yeah. Yeah. We got some crazy days ahead, but you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I believe that we're on the right path, that we are laying the brickwork for a foundation that we can all be proud of and uh, build a future that we all, that we want our children and the generations that they deserve. Yeah. Nice. I agree. Okay. We'll say goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye.